Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that will give you a skill set that will make you marketable for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach from Metro Atlanta. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent also from Atlanta, currently in North Carolina. And I'm David Williams, and I'm a dad from Chicago, Illinois. This week in the news, the Supreme Court seems ready to back payments to student athletes. An article by Adam Liptak in the New York Times. This will be the very last chapter in the book. So this is a momentous occasion. Mark and Anika will be discussing how can I develop the character to withstand life storms. What is more important, your grade in an AP class or your AP test score? Our interview is part three of four with Mark Kantrowitz on the new simplified FAFSA. And there will be no college spotlight this week. Friends, have an idea that really ex- we're really excited about, and I'm just planting a seed now. You'll be hearing more about it later, uh, but we've got a decent number of college counselors who listen to this podcast, and when I mean college counselors, I mean all stripes. It could be school-based counselors, school-based guidance counselors, could be boarding school counselors, um, private day school counselors, independent educational consultants, um, as well as CBO counselors. Uh, we have listeners in all of those groups. And well, I want to start semi-annual meeting amongst us. So the first one, and you'll be hearing more about this, and we'll discuss what happened this year. Um, it, it, we'll share our experiences and we'll, uh, what's that word? Crowdsource our knowledge, you know, about different schools. It'll obviously be extremely confidential. Everybody have to sort of swear to confidentiality. And we don't need to mention students' names. Of course, we wouldn't do that. But we'll just talk about our experience. So say we say, University of Michigan, what was your experience with them this year? And we'll sort of crowdsource our knowledge, and we'll all sort of refine our skills. So you're going to be hearing a little bit more. I wanted to throw it out there because we're into May now. And uh, I'll have a little survey, and I'll get insights from everybody as to what schools you're interested in discussing. And we'll see which ones are listed the most, and those will be the ones that we'll talk about. But we'll have a little survey. Let's just give a little bit about your background because... I'm going to throw this out there. No parents coming in masquerading like you're a college counselor. We're going to snuff you out. This is just for college counselors. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But it, it'll do a sharpen all of our knowledge. We have a parental meter. We can, we can sense you coming a mile <laughs> off. That it's your helicopter blades. They give a prop wash and we can figure it out. <laughs> Don't talk about you and the others. Say me, man, Mr. Helicopter over there in, in the flesh. When he was uh, going through the process, now he's like doing the you other on me. We have a specialized stealth mode. You never know we're hovering. <laughs> yeah. But I think it'll be great. And, and the reason why I'm going to do this twice a year is because, you know, first time we'll talk about our experience with colleges. Next time we'll talk about any issues that we all collectively as a college counseling community want to get a bunch of opinions on. And we'll survey and find out what you guys want to talk about, create a little bit of an agenda created time and thanks to zoom video we can uh, do this from the co- convenience of our home so something new we're cu- kicking off college your college bound kid plus we have to do something now that the book chapter is gone so there we go okay friends our admissions tip so a lot of times this process can seem very frustrating to a parent because colleges sometimes make you feel like we don't want you talking to us at all all we want is your money. Get out of the way, parent. We want to talk to the kid. And you can be like, well, what about me? Is there a place for me? I still think this is a parent-child partnership. And it is. And so here's a great place for parents to do something that will be extremely helpful. Keep track of all of your child's activities and their awards, because you're going to have to present that, whether it's a common application, coalition, a school's institutional app, You're going to need to record all of those activities, dates, times, and awards. And my experience is very, very hard. Most people start this process 11th grade, some even fall of 12th. You're going to have to recount everything that your child did. It's not easy to do that. But if a parent is tracking throughout the whole time with dates, 
um, it's going to make it a lot easier. And also, you may need to do a resume. And if you have all that information recorded, activities, awards with dates, it's going to make it much easier. So that's a great thing that a parent can do. Become the, what's it, not stenographer. What's the word I'm looking for here, Dave? The family recorder. There we go, the family recorder. It'll help your child out, and it's a great role for a parent in this process. All right, Dave. I'm trying to think. I've got one here that I'm going to give you a hint. 95% of above average high school juniors know, would get this correct. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, now you feel bad. I don't want to be right. I want right. to be you want to be the 5% compared to the kids, right? That's right. Is one of these ones you're either going to know it or you don't. So I'm going to throw it out here. Okay. The term is a push. What is a push? A like a separate word push? A P U S H all uppercase. A P U A Oh man, you're the five percent. I can feel it. Pacific. Oh man, Dave, no, no, the kids I, are laughing at you a, right a now. Push. Wait, wait. A push. <laughs> Something with social media, maybe. You know. <laughs> Dave, I have TikTok, to TikTok, re- Instagram. I, 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 I just, I just need to relieve you of your misery because I can hear parents saying right now, "Sophie, come over here. John, come listen to this." And maybe it has something to do with. Are you woke or sleep or <laughs> no? I'm going to make it worse for you. 90% of parents of an 11th or 12th grader who is above average know what I'm talking about right now. So let me just relieve you of your misery. Okay. And the answer is APUS history. Nobody called that's the, the term, but Mission A-P-U-S Council. APUS history? Think, of, think oh, about on. it. Think about it. AAP, right? AP. Yeah. Right. And then. It's a push, a p, and then u s h. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a Canadian. Ah, uh, stop the Canadian man! You've been living over here since you were 18. Your kids went to <laughs> your daughter went to Chicago. Don't try to pull the Canadian card because you didn't get a layup. That's like saying you know you're you're supposed to do a layup in the layup line, you know, and you and you go and you and you fumble the layup and you like. A bee stung me. A bee <laughs> stung me right when I was going up in motion. No, he blew the layup, dude. <laughs> a push. You know, in, in, in Eastern Europe, a push is actually an attempted coup. <laughs> <laughs> can't believe he tried that. I'll give you credit for this. You've been on here since episode 105. It's now 66 issues. And it's the first time you tried the Canadian card excuse. So, I'll... <laughs> okay. all right. It is time for the big number. And the big number is 79. And what 79 refers to is the percent of the cost of attendance that the Pell Grant covered in 1975. And if you want to know why there's such a strong movement, you know, from many, many organizations led, led by NCAN and many others, is because right now the Pell Grant covers 29% of the cost of attendance. Wow. So it's gone from 79% to 29% as it has not kept pace at all with the cost of college, which is why you've got a strong, strong, strong movement to double the Pell. So there we go. All right, Dave, we got a lot of places we could go with with this one. And Dave and I are both sports guys, so he would, he's going to do a little bit better on the sports topic than a push. And so uh, let's take the article away. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. Okay, well, this is an amazing article, and I'll tell you what's amazing. It is the first time I can remember where I read an article, and I actually had more in agreement with Clarence Thomas and Alito (laughs) Than I did with Sotomayor. Don't forget Kavanaugh, uh, Kavanaugh as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So, folks, in order to discuss this art- article, I must temporarily en- re- enroll in the fraternal order of Incognito and join <laughs> my my brother Clarence, so we can discuss <laughs> for the first and only time. I agree with Brother Clarence. (laughs) (laughs) What are we talking about, folks? 
Well, most of you don't may not remember that last year the federal appeals court ruled that the NCAA could allow payments to athletes if those payments were benefited directly to education. So things like musical instruments, scientific equipment, postgraduate scholarships, tutoring, study abroad, internships were out all now allowable for colleges to give athletes but it did not permit salaries. So that was an appeal court ruling. This article discusses the conversations that were had when this was then appealed by the NAACP straight to the Supreme Court. And let me just say what some of the responses were by the justices. Kavanaugh said antitrust laws should not be a cover for exploitation of student-athletes. Clarence Thomas says, Coaches' salaries have ballooned, and they are in the amateur ranks, as are the players. Sotomayor basically said, How do we know we are not just destroying the game as it exists? But the summary statement really came from Alito. And I'm going to say the summary statement, then we're going to discuss it, Mark. Sure. What uh, Alito said is that, Athletes face training requirements that leave little time or energy for study, constant pressure to put sports above study, and pressure to drop out of hard majors and hard classes, and really shockingly low graduation rates. Only a tiny percentage ever go on to make any money in professional sports. So the argument is they are recruited, they are used up, and then they are cast aside without even a college degree. How can this be defended in the name of amateurism? And he further uh, alleged to the NCAACP that to, to the NCAA, I'm sorry, NCAA, NCAA <laughs> Man, sorry. Man, that was like you trying to get HP. That's like you're trying to get HBCU right when we first started, man. That was a real struggle. <laughs> Took you a little while. Now you're there. <laughs> now you just switched to another fumble number, bunch of initials to fumble on. Absolutely. But here's what, how a leader summed it up. When, when the NCAA lawyer, Wasserman, basically said that they shouldn't be paying their athletes through these educational allowances, Alito alleged that athletes are already being paid. And they, he said, quote, they get lower admission standards, they get tuition, room, and board. That's a form of pay. So the distinction is not whether they are going to be paid. It is the form in which they are going to be paid and how much they are paid. So let me stop there, Mark. This is actually a very nuanced and complex topic. Yep. But I, I hope this, I set the stage for our discussion. Yeah, so I want to go back and even give more history. Uh, but before I do, I want people to think of the image of a tug of war. I think everybody's seen a tug of war. One side's got the rope. The other guy's got the rope. You got to pull the other side across the line and the strongest team wins. And so if you think of a tug of war on one side, you have players and player advocates. On the other side, you have the bully on the block, the NCAA that brings in over a billion dollars as an organization and the governing body setting the rules. Well, the, uh, the, the NCAA just was wiping the floor in this tug of war. It's literally like there's a really good academic school that's really underrated. I need to do a call spotlight on it in Georgia called Mercer. But Mercer plays Alabama at football. It's a joke. It's like 70 nothing, And that's sort of how, it, how these tug of war contests are. It's like Mercer playing Alabama. You know, NCAA has just been destroying the players and player advocates. But now the tide is really starting to turn. It's turning in a lot of ways. And so I just want to give some context. I actually want to read part of an article that appeared in the San Juan Star on April 1st. The name of the article is entitled, How Blowing Up College Sports Became a Rallying Cry for Some in Washington. And, and here's what it says. And it's by Alan, uh, Alan Blinder. I always like to you know, shout out. So it starts out talking about Ramaji Huma, who is a former college football player, and he's been at the Justice Department lectern for eight seconds when he began an excoriation of the NCAA. And here's what he said. 
the governing body of college sports was, he declared, check this out, Dave, a predatory economic cartel that treats players like university property rather than people. Now, Huma had long since used similar language. And he's the leader of the of the National College Players Association, which is an advocacy group. But this is the difference. In his 2019 speech to a room full of antitrust experts at the Robert F. Kennedy Building, signaled a shift in Washington. Less than a decade earlier, Huma recalled, federal law enforcement officials told him that the Capitol's political climate did not support any action against the NCAA. Now, Huma, as the leader of the Players Association, is being invited to speak on Pennsylvania Avenue. More and more people find what the NCAA is doing patently unacceptable in terms of the treatment of athletes, says Cory Booker, who played football at Stanford and is champion a proposal that would compel colleges to share athletic profits with some players. The association, he added, and this is a quote from Booker, was not realizing the moral view of this ground has shifted. And the article goes on to say, the NCAA is embroiled in perhaps the most crucial stretch of its long relationship with Washington, where top officials have increasingly voiced doubts about the management and the restriction on college sports. And then it goes on to say, on Wednesday, the 115th anniversary of the NCAA's founding, the Supreme Court is slated to hear the association's appeal in a case about caps on certain benefits for student athletes this summer around the time the justices could announce their ruling a florida law is scheduled to take effect allowing players to profit of their fame disrupting the uniform rules that have regulated college admissions for generations so remember the words of the head of the players association huma the governing body of college sports was as he declared, a predatory economic cartel that treats players like property rather than people. And that view has just been gaining steam. Now, it's not new. We can go back 40 years now, or sorry, 30 years, when Chris Weber of the Fab Five at Michigan explained why he walked away and he was done. And I remember him watching this on, this, on that uh, ESPN documentary, Dave, uh, Fab Five. And he said, when I walked into the Michigan bookstore, and I saw they were selling my jersey for 65 bucks, and I wasn't getting a penny. It was time for me to bounce and get out of there. And so that's the first thing. Now let's talk about another thing that's happened, sort of chips that have fallen, if you want to put it that way. And that is California Governor Newsom signing into law some major legislation that happened about 20 months ago. And so let me just read this. So California basically defied the U.S. sports world governing by the NCAA after the governor signed into law that will allow college athletes to hire agents and make money from their own endorsements. Now, this is scheduled to take effect in 2023 at both public and private universities, and the state will be allowed to sign deals uh, with sportswear firms, software drink makers, other businesses. And this is here's a quote. It's going to change college sports for the better by having the now interest finally of the athletes on par with the interests of the institutions. So that's coming from California Governor Gavin Newsom. The NCAA vigorously fought back and tried it to stop it. And it doesn't hurt when who who is your main spokesperson behind this? LeBron James. LeBron James has thrown his weight behind this. He's done events with Gavin Newsom. And a quote from Grames, we are now rebalancing the power arrangement. One more change. So if you look at the way athletes, athletics has worked for major sports, uh, if you were in a major sport, you could not leave your school without having to sit out a year. It's called the transfer rule. But in mid-April of this year, Division One Council announced it voted a plan to approve to allow college athletes to transfer one time as an undergraduate and not have to sit out the season. This is major because player advocates have said, wait a minute, how come the coach can pick up and leave and go from one school to another and not have to sit out? But if a player does it, they have to sit out a year. And so players finally got enough power. So this is now going to apply to the key revenue producing sports because in the past, other sports could do it. But it was not applicable for football, 
men's and women's basketball, men's ice hockey, and baseball. And this is such a big change that Steve Lavin, former coach of the UCLA, has said in the last 40 years, the three biggest changes in basketball have been the introduction of the shot clock, the three-point line, and now the new transfer portal rule. So the point is players are getting more power. They fought back and said, why should we have to sit out? And, and they've won that appeal. And so now over 1,000 players are transferring. So you take all that and now you fast forward to this case, the one we're talking about. This is a West Virginia football player who's challenged the NCAA and they're trying to stop him from not just him. You know, he's bringing the case, of course, against being able to not only use your likeness. And the, the case, by the way, I think this is going to go down and become really one of the most famous famous cases we've ever seen. The player's name is Shawnee Alston. And so that's the case that's being heard right now, the so-called Alston case, which came after a three-judge panel on the ninth U.S. Circuit of Appeals ruled in May, and they upheld the lower court ruling barring the NCAA from capping educational-related expenses and benefits for student-athletes. And so so that's kind of the background. I kind of want people to understand the background, and these major dominoes have been falling, and the players have been getting more power. And now this particular case, of which Dave was reading quotes from the Supreme Court, uh, um, it's being argued literally right now as we speak, and a, and a decision is expected before the end of June. So this should be, um, and they're and they're saying this would be the biggest um, decision on the NCAA in ninety years. So um, what are your thoughts, Dave? I've talked for a while. Anything I said that stimulated any thoughts for you? Well, yeah, I mean the article points out that. Alabama pays its weight coaches $700,000 a year. So that's not the coach that gets well north of $5 million. And you've already pointed out the number from a couple of weeks ago that uh, in 40 out of 50 states, the highest paid state employees are inevitably college coaches. And so there's a huge exploitation factor going on when you look at the graduation rates of Division I athletes, especially African Americans. And oftentimes they're in the 20s or even lower. And these kids are literally giving of their bodies and their future mental health, often with football injuries, to support billion-dollar programs. It's almost like a form of gladiatorial servitude. And so uh, when you get such a huge consensus, a, a broad consensus, that something is really out of whack and in balance, it tells you that things are about to change. But I still foresee some huge imbalances in and the uh, Division One football ranks, but what what's your thoughts about those? Yeah, I, I mean the the court case is trying. The NCAA is trying to argue that this is going to open the floodgates and it's going to destroy amateurism, and that the fans the fans don't want to see amateurism destroyed. But if you look at the quotes coming out from from the justices, they're really pushing back against that and questioning whether or not this will destroy amateurism. I, I'm a supporter of this, Dave. I, I mean, I have had a problem with players and oftentimes black players just being exploited. It has felt it's just too reminiscent of slavery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <let's> say <laughs> Basically. It. No, we're, I mean, really, like, the, you know, the coach gets all the money, all the acclaim, doesn't risk their body. I have to tell a story. So when I was in theological school, there was a, a guy there. I remember he's hanging out. When I first came in, he's just chilling and watching some TV. And we had a long conversation. It turns out he used to play for the Detroit Lions. And we had a lengthy conversation about you know, playing in the NFL. He's a running back. And he's now a student at theological school. And he said to me, he said, the percentage of my former players, including myself, that will deal with something for the rest of their life from football is 100%. 100% of us. We'll have a knee, we'll have a back, we'll have a hip. And so the argument that some have postulated has been, well, you're getting room and board, you're getting an education, education is invaluable, and you're acting like you're not getting anything. Well, first of all, it's not free. They're working 40, 50 hours. But the argument has always been it's what they're getting in proportion to literally multi-millions that they're bringing into the institution, and others are making so much money off of them. And can I just jump in here? First of all, many of these kids are not getting an education, and they're accepted into these programs in the most cynical fashion with the coaches and the admission staff knowing full well 
that the many of these kids will not graduate. They don't even have a chance, but they will use them for one or two or three years. Uh, I remember UNLV was famous for this. They probably had like 10% of their class would graduate, and then maybe Jerry Carcadian would get them a role in a, as a greeter in a casino. They had no academic future. They were being used purely for the revenue production. Non-revenue producing sports such as crew and lacrosse and so forth. What, what, what's supporting most of those non-revenue sports are these one or two revenue producing sports such as basketball and football. So here again, you have these gladiatorial activities that are are ex- being used to support all these other programs that are not supporting many of the uh, minority athletes, and the minority athletes are getting virtually nothing at the end of the road. Yeah, so so Dave and I are supporting, uh, supporters of this. We think it's good. It's nice to see some progress coming along, and we'll see what the we'll see what the ruling ends up being. Um, but it could, you know, significantly change college football and college basketball. And, and one of the things that I think is completely fair is the whole likeness debate. So that's part of this debate that's going on. In other words, should I be able to get paid if, if my name is being used, if an endorser wants to use my name? NCAA would not allow that at all. There's no way in the world you could have Coca-Cola run a commercial with you and your name. You know, the new legislation, you would be able to make money from doing that. And why should somebody not be able to do that? This is America. Anyway, this is a little different article than normal. Normally, Dave and I have articles where there's like an almost an immediate what I call so what factor, right? Like what we want to, our listeners to take it away and to apply to their lives. This is just a different one. This is one to be in touch with what's happening, a pretty titanic shift within the culture. And just as an informed citizen, uh, just to know what's happened historically. And what looks like it's a we're about to be on the verge of a real breakthrough and more of a just a FYI as an informed citizen. Now it's time for our step by step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Oh it's, a li- it's a life shifting moment, Mark. Yes, <laughs> it is. It's sentimental. We're here with Anika for her last episode. <laughs> and I'm so shaken. I'm so rattled that I I said, do you start or do I start? You think about 171 episodes. I know that, right? But I'm I'm jarred by the. So I'm like give it to our listeners a behind the scene. One of those things you don't really tell people, but I'm mm-hmm. telling them. So Nick and I were talking. This is like probably a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. And I said something like. After we're done the book, do you think we should just drop the book chapter or pick a new book up? And Nico was like, you plan on doing this after 171? I thought the plan, I thought the plan was to stop the podcast. I was like, I didn't think that was the plan at all. Oh, <laughs> Remember that moment? Gonna, yes. I, I was going to reference that, but you beat me to it. And you were like, wait, what? Like, we're going to podcast forever, right? Yes. <laughs> so, so I said, what if, we, what if we bring Dave in and he does half, you do half? We tried everything we could, but we finally had to let Anika fly her wings. Well, you know, I'm a se- I'm a series kind of girl, Mark. You know, yeah, I know. Long stuff. She's so she. So Nick and I have been talking about this for a year and a half at least, as I've attempted to recruit her, but I finally realized you gotta let somebody go chase their other visions, and she's given us four great years. So what more can you I ask? I cannot believe it has been that long. That is total insanity. First of all, and yeah. no, but but first of all, let me just remind everybody and you. That Jalen is going to be 25 years old this year. That's insane, isn't it? And we started working with you when he was in seventh grade. I know. So let's just <laughs> sit and marinate on that for a little bit. Yeah. And and it didn't even start around college admissions, of course. But, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. first of all, we had boarding always taken... Boarding school. You started well, with boarding not, school. And that, but it was just like, you know, we had always taken education seriously when they, you know, elementary, middle. Yeah. But what you introduced us to in big old seventh grade was how to position your kids for success, just like in general. So, I mean, I have, I have been, and you know this, Mark, you know, I've been blown away by your knowledge and your personal commitment to all these families for so long. It's, it's just like my whole purpose in life since seventh grade was I got to connect Mark to every human being humanly possible because people need to know about this. Like people need to know all this stuff. So here we are, fast forward. Here we are, 171 weeks into a podcast <laughs> about the book of college admissions. And, you know, but and that's been my commitment. But it was hilarious when you were like, wait, we're not doing this forever. <laughs> yeah, but your commitment has been real because 
what people don't know is I had a 10 hour college admissions video series before long before the book, long before the podcast. This is like I worked on it from 2012, 2013, launched in 2014. Anika was so committed to getting that thing out there. Everything. Everything Mark related. <laughs> remember we we hop remember we hopped in a hopped in a car once and drove five hours to Brunswick mm-hmm. to meet mm-hmm. with this guy who wanted to invest like a hundred thousand dollars into our product. Yeah. And then she had a stickers all over not stickers, she had like professionally done um <laughs> game changer stuff on her car, like marketing it. And so she has just been gung ho supportive of trying to bridge this knowledge gap and Knowing there are people out here that don't have knowledge and what can we do to get it to them and level the playing field. And so this has been fantastic working with you for what's now basically 12 years, really. Oh, my God. Hey, well, it has been a complete honor, Mark, like to work with you. And I just want to thank you on behalf of every mama and daddy in the world on your impact because you know i mean it doesn't stop here i mean physically i'm not doing the work but you know i know i'm I just know. converting into a loyal listener but i'm still spreading the word yeah um, but yes yeah, i know you're all- not far away <laughs> and i know and i know that as little johnny gets a little six hits 16 and gets the itch <laughs> nick is gonna be right back well you know like what what's going on with college admissions and right the well, tune to ear to the ground you know at least at a minimum loyal listener and that's sporadically right. being on the podcast every every now and then when i can can convince Dave or Lisa to get sick for a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is serious stuff. And I'm just thankful for all the folks that have been listening and tuning in. Oh, my God. And as a matter of fact, I just for a, a mom just uh, messaged through Facebook the other day. I'm like, make sure you send your questions to the, your questions at your college bound kids. So nobody forget that because, you know, we're going to have a little transition period in terms of who's going to be monitoring the you know, all of this stuff. And Mark's got to do show notes. So oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And it goes a show note girl, <laughs> but it's OK. We'll make it work. But you know what? I, I'm really glad you said that because we actually could use some more questions from a listener. Like sometimes we have a nice little 10, 10 in the in the kitty and we're good. And then sometimes it runs a little low. Now we've got a 10 call spotlights that have been requested. So we got a nice little stack of them for the next, mm-hmm. you know, a few months. Uh, but we could use some more questions. I think we might have just one or two that are up, which is, you know, they always come in. But well, you got another one coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> they're coming in. The I know they're coming in and we love them. We love them. We love them. And. Some of them are amazing. And so, you know, thank you. But thank you so much, Anika. I just have to say that. And I know I speak for a lot of people. I was talking to a mom from Tennessee this week who never misses an episode. And she said, I am going to miss me some Anika. Aww. And so you you have you have your fans out there that are far more than you realize. So so we're grateful. We're grateful. But let's dive in. Yep. Because I'm not the 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 tear shedder type, but if we start getting too <laughs> sappy, I might you know not be it might be too might not be a good over here. It might be a little wreck. So we are doing this countdown, and we are looking at where Fortune 500 CEOs went to undergrad. And we said it's supposed to be a top ten, but when you have eight tied with ten, it ends up being like seventeen or eighteen. So we had eight schools tied with five CEOs, all in ten spot. They were Yale, Illinois, Bucknell, Texas, Princeton, Lehigh, SUNY Binghamton, and Michigan State. And then we have in sixth place, four tied there, UPenn, Cal Berkeley, Texas A&M, and Purdue. And we are now into the top five. <laughs> Coming in fifth place all by itself with seven CEOs, Stanford University, Ooh. Palo Alto. Okay. Shout out to Stanford. Love that school. I just had such a great six days out there um, that I kind of have a special place in my heart for that school. So shout out to Stanford. All right, Stanford, standing alone. Look at you. Awesome. All right, Anika. Now, listen, I'll tell you one thing I'm not shedding tear about. The last chapter of the book. I'm shedding tear about missing you. <laughs> In order to write a book, especially a 691-page book with illustrations and over 200 illustrations and everything, you've got to throw your heart, mind, and soul into it. And I did. I was up to 4 a.m. for a long stretch working on it. But now I have book burnout. <laughs> I don't care to see the book for six months. <laughs> I'm ready to retire it. So I don't. I'm not going to miss that part. But. I am excited about this chapter, mm-hmm. and it says, how can I develop the character to withstand life storms? And so just to put in context, the last eight chapters of the book basically deal with thriving while you're in college, how to graduate, increase your chance of graduation. And this one really goes well beyond graduation. It's more into like even life impact after graduation. And so um, you've read the chapter. What are your takeaways? Yeah. So first of all, as I read, I was like, man, I don't think I've uttered these words to Janae before, like literally, like I need to say this to her. Um, but basically what it's about is about how to withstand 
life storms. And when I mentioned Janae, what I'm saying is that you tell your kids or you've told your kids in the past that there is a storm a coming. There will be Correct. storms brewing and you need to be prepared for them, not just in college, but, you know, high school, too. Yep. And life. And life, just in general. So I'm like, dang, that's actually, let me say that. Let me call her after we finish this podcast. There you go. So you just go into, you know, how research, you know, has shown that emotional intelligence, which is a character trait, Mm -hmm. is what gets you through these storms. And these kids need to be prepared for that. So you've listed these 14 character traits that you... You mentioned that, you know, you, you've you looked at other successful people and people who persevered and made it through those storms. And, and these are, you know, were the consistent ones among all of them. And you also mentioned that if they didn't have all 14 of these, they had at least 10 of them. So, you know, that those are the things. So do you want to go through this list or how, how do you? Yeah, wanna... let me make a couple. Let me make a few comments. And so there is a reason why one of the most frequent college specific questions that you will see is something to the effect of tell me a time when you experienced failure and how did you handle it? Tell me a time when you had a significant disappointment or adverse circumstances or some, something like that. And the reason why colleges ask that question is because they're very, very much cognizant of what Anika said in the start, which is you're, you are rarely going to have four years of your life where you do will not have one of the following things. You may not have all of them. You may not have most of them. But one of the following things. Financial problems, friendship problems, social problems, job-related problems, emotional problems, academic problems, health, health-related problems, or family issues. You know, And I probably forgot a bucket in there. But those are just the ones that kind of popped into my head as sort of big categories of trials, right? If you're not getting it with your health, you're getting it with the finances, you're getting it in the employment world or some tension with the family. And so colleges are very much aware of that. So one of the reasons why they ask that question, um, I'm going to, I'm sorry, Nick, I got to revert to a sports illustration here. You know, sorry. <laughs> hey, did, hey, did, sorry, not it, sorry. I, you're sorry, not sorry. Exactly. And they get it at home. From Javon and from Jalen. Little John likes sports too, I know. He does. So you're getting it from all the men. But in boxing, there's like always a question. I'm not a big boxing fan. It just popped in my head. It is, can you take a punch? And what colleges want to know is, can you take a punch? Or when the bottom falls out and life hits you hard with a storm, are you going to be stuck on the ground or in a catatonic state in the corner? You can't get out of your bed or whatever. Or can you get up? And so that's why they ask a lot of those kinds of questions, because they want to know what do you have to draw on in your experience that will help you weather the storms that you're going to have here? And for, for a lot of more selective schools, they're very much acutely aware of the fact that they attract a lot of really high achievers, oftentimes perfectionistic students. So a lot of times perfectionistic students have a lot of anxiety, you know, and in and, and their drivenness with their perfectionism and they know like, okay, guess what? You used to be at the top of your class. You're not going to be at the top of class here. How are you going to handle that? And so, so they want to know if you've got that extra um in you to do that. And it's also a reason why colleges don't mind at all. If you pick a recommender for your recommendations that can come a little bit about some struggle that you had and how you work through that struggle. You know, they, they would much rather have a recommendation from from someone that says, you know, calculus did not really come that easy to this student, but they worked, they came in, they sought extra help, and they persevered. Then to say that I've never seen this person ever struggle at all in any way, shape, or form. And don't get me wrong, even that is nuanced. Once we get into certain kinds of schools, there are certain kinds of schools that that to, to know that calculus is very difficult for you might turn some of them off. So I don't want to make it sound like there's one size fits all, but maybe I shouldn't have used that as an example. Maybe I should have used, you know, something else like your health, you know, persevering through really difficult times and they were in the hospital, but they still sought me out. They emailed and they found out what the work was and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's maybe a better example. Um, But I mean, nothing's wrong with the academic example. I just want to be 
the, the challenge always of this podcast is conveying the nuance so that it can mm-hmm. apply to a wide range of circumstances, right? right so right. for most schools, what I say would be a perfectly great answer. There's just a certain kind of school that if you're struggling with calculus, that, that you know, that might not be good to them, but, but you get the point. So anyway, that's the background. The other thing I wanted to share is you're going to get multiple recommended resources in this chapter because I do mention some of my favorite books that talk about sort of this whole thing, this whole thing, meaning having the character to withstand life storms. One of them is Carol Dweck's book, Growth Mindset. And I got the privilege of spending about an hour with her in Arizona just talking about her book. She was a keynote speaker at a conference I was at. And then I got to talking to her husband and then, and then make a long story short, we all went to the airport together. And so I just picked her brain in the car. (laughs) It was fun. And then Paul Tuff's book, another person I've had a chance to spend some time with his book, how children succeed. And then Angela Duckworth, who I've met, but just for like 10 or 15 minutes, her book, grit, the power and passion of perseverance. All of those are really, really, really good books that speak to this. So, Mark, let me ask you this. Are you are you recommending that the parents read those books or the kids? So they would be good for either the parent or the kids. Mm-hmm. I think parents, for sure, it can help you to manage and shepherd your child. And for kids, they're great if it's if it's a kid that wants to read it. Right. If it's a kid, if it's just like just jamming cold spinach down their throat and they hate spinach. I don't really see that being that productive. Okay. But if you've got a student that just loves to read and loves to learn, these would be fantastic books for students to read. So really, both is really the answer to your question. Okay. I have parents in mind because our listener base is mostly parents and, and college counselors. Those are our two biggest groups of listeners. Right. It's just I've long realized that we can't compete with, like, the Spotify playlist and all the <laughs> other stuff that kids can do with when it comes to their time that uh, listening to a college admission podcast that goes over an hour and a half just doesn't quite cut it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, when every time when we get students that send in questions, I'm like, oh, we have student listeners. I know, they right? Exist. Yeah, that is exciting when we see that. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Which we have one this time, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, this is a good one. Our question is a good one later. So, so those are just three fantastic books. And as far as the list, yeah, I sort of close with, a combination of stuff that I have gleaned from reading all these books, studying, watching, observing. And this is kind of my um, advice of the character traits that highly accomplished individuals they usually possess. The more of these they have, the more likely they are to really, really have a significant impact. And that's how I define success is about impact. It's not about money. So so why don't we um, I won't take a whole lot of time on them, Anika, but why don't we just Read them off, and and maybe if there's one or two you want to comment on, we'll do it that way. Well, I can, you know, and then we can combine a couple of you together, right? So, you know, being a hard worker and grit and resiliency, you have those listed separately, Um, but they can be. Yeah, I do see those as different because grit, grit and resilience is when you're knocked down, you get back up. Okay. There are some people that, like, for example, the person they just get straight A's and then they get a C and they just they just fold like a cheap tent. Mm-hmm. So there, mm-hmm. to me, those are different. Like okay. grit, grit and resilience is like when when life crashes, you get back up. Yeah, but but I guess it's important to couple that being a hard worker because to your point, you've got those kids that drive, 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 and they can't do anything else. And you know, mm-hmm. so okay, and then you know, just being, uh, how about doing what you love and what you're good? Yeah, at, you know, that's really important. Those those two together, doing what you love and what you're good at is just really, really important and. You know, when you do what you love, you're going to be better at it, first of all, because you're going to be willing to work hard and it's not going to feel like work to you. Your enthusiasm will be contagious. And when you do what you're good at, then you'll excel. And so those are those are important, both of them. Okay. And what else do you want to share? I want to I'm going to just do one, two more couples and then I'll let you close it out. So this next one, these two together, being a self-advocate and an initiator and being focused and disciplined. Um, those, I know we've talked about that a lot and that's critical, especially the Mm self-advocacy piece of it. Yep. The discipline is equally as important because some people can get their body to do what their mind knows it should do. And some people really struggle with this. And then this last parent I want to mention is just being unafraid of risk taking hint, hint. That's for everybody. Parents too. And, uh, having an optimistic worldview, just like just being optimistic. Yeah, seeing the glass half empty, not half full. Very, very, really important. And that's a lot of what you see in Dweck's book as well. So I don't know if you remember this. I just had a flashback, Anika. Remember 
like must have been about three years ago, but it was one of my countdowns on the podcast. <laughs> and we looked at uh, it was a study that was done out of Cornell of people. I know there were at least 60, might have been 65. Mm -hmm. And it looked at what their biggest regrets were. You remember that? Do you I remember vaguely that? Vaguely remember Vakes? that. Yeah. Now you know we've been doing it a while. Right. Exactly. You know, we don't even remember a whole countdown. It was like <laughs> two months of me counting down all these regrets. Right. So they were like, yeah, it was like the biggest regrets that 65-year-olds had. You know, it was one of my favorite countdowns. But I had a flashback because uh, when you said take risks, that was like one of the biggest regrets that they had. They were like, you know, I had a chance to start my own business and I got scared. You know, mm -hmm. I had this opportunity to take this job and I was going to have to move all the way across the country. And I said to myself, you know, I don't know anybody there, blah, blah, blah. And, I, you know, it was and they felt like they played it too safe, especially when it came to like sort of going for what their dreams were. So that's that that's that kind of risk taking in there. Two more that I always have to emphasize. Um, number two, number three that I list here, ability to build relationships well and get along with a wide range of different people. And number three, personal integrity. And I will say something. Another thing that I've sat back and watched, I've watched why have people gotten fired that I've worked with over the years? I look at every single time someone's gotten fired. And I also read a study once on this. And people get fired rarely because they lack the technical competence of sort of mastery of their subject matter, right? It's not like um, they're in accounting and they're terrible accounting. That's not the biggest reason why people get fired. Right. And from my own anecdotal observation, as well as from research that I've done, people get fired because they can't get along with others. And they get fired because they cut some type of corners in a way where they lose the respect to the organization, something that was considered crossing the line. Mm, yep. And that's what causes really smart people with fancy fancy degrees from designer schools to lose their job. And so I can't emphasize those two enough. And, you know, I will, I'll say one thing about the, se the first point I made, the ability to get along with a wide range of different people. I remember when I first came to Kit, I don't know if you remember Sabrina Player. I don't even remember that name. I don't know if you I remember that remember. name. But... I met a, it's, you know, I saw her name recently, and she gave me a flashback. That's interesting. Okay, interesting. So first person I worked for when I, when I was at Kip, and I remember she said once, and I kind of took me back. She said, you know what? If you can't get along with a teammate, you need to work it out. Because it's not acceptable to be on this team and not get along with somebody else on the team. And I remember first thinking to myself, that feels a little harsh because, like, some people, like, just don't get along with other people or whatever. But then as I kind of moved more into management, I really got that. I really understood it. Like, I need the team to function well. Right. And I need you to work it out. You know, work it out. And so – and it's obviously not always easy because some people, you know, can be like oil and water with you, right, based on personalities and temperaments and how you're raised differently, different values and all of that, politics. All kinds of things can like create divisions. Uh, so this this one here, like ability to build relationships well and get along with a wide range of different people, that is critical. And I'm thinking about another student that I worked with, and uh, that was a pastor with incredible people skills, actually. And he just had done a lot of really good things in terms of nationally as a speaker. But in working with multiple kids, you know, from the family, he was never worried about one of his kids that didn't have as high high grades as the others. You know, like a lot of people think, well, geez, you know, this one's like a B student. The others are A students, you know? He's like, I'm not worried about their person at all. Like, their, their people skills are off the chain. They're going to be fine in life. Mm -hmm. And I, I cannot em emphasize it enough. People skills, people skills, ability to get along with a wide range of people and personal integrity. So those are some of my favorites. Oh, and number five, being a lifetime learner. Hmm. That is so, so, so important. And I really do feel we have a very limited view of education. We have a tendency to think of education as formal education, like where you get your degree from. And that's not education. Education is any type of learning. Podcasts, webinars, YouTube, you know, us, mentorship, listening to people, all of that stuff. Reading. People reading, reading, books. reading, reading audio books, you know, all of that stuff. Like, People that do well are sponges for knowledge. They may not have a lot of formal knowledge. They may not have advanced degrees or a degree at all, but they will be learners and they will imbibe and immerse themselves in learning. The what the best ones will. And so those I know we didn't hit all of them, but those are the ones I wanted to. Uh, we almost hit them all. I'll mention one more: kind and caring. 
Mm-hmm. That's also really important. Kindness, caring. People can tell. The old saying, people don't care what you know until they know how much you care. That's really true. So I wanted to summarize and end the book with a character chapter, because I really do believe like your character determines your destiny. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Anika, we're really now down to the last question from a listener. And then question I say from goodbye. A listener. And and I was correct. It is from a student. They're anonymous, it is. and that's okay. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. That's okay. We'll take anonymous. A student from uh, Illinois. Yep, they at least identified their state, which is yeah, helpful. Yeah, they identified the state. Midwest. So what this question asks is, what is more important, your grade in an AP class or your AP test score? Ooh, good question. Very good question. And, you know, it would have been easier if they would have said what is more important, your grade in an AP course or whether or not the school sees what your test scores are. That would have been a lot easier because, as I've said before on the podcast, not all, but most college admissions officers, particularly at when schools do holistic admissions, they're trained to not judge when they don't see scores. And and there can be a lot of reasons. This test is about a hundred bucks. This is this is all conversations I've had with the mission officers. It's just me pulling this out of the wall. Like this is just things they've to- they tell me and have told me over the years. Like when we don't see a, a score, we don't. It could be a financial issue. We don't hold that against a kid. Or I can remember a conversation with one. They said, "How do I know the, the grandmother didn't pass the day before? Or how do I know the student just wasn't s- extremely sick?" So I, I don't want to judge that. I want to judge the information I have, not the information I don't have. So it would have been a much easier question, but the, the students smartly made it harder. They didn't really <laughs> say what if there's no score compared to grades. Um, what they uh, what they said. Oh, by the way, I just have to say, not every admission officer feels that way. So that's once again, people are individuals, but a lot feel the way in terms of not judging with the score. There are some that do judge with the score. You just have to throw that out there. But the student asked, asked, okay, if you're deciding between you know having a grade. In in this case, let's assume it's a, let's look at it this way, a high grade and a low score versus a low grade and a high score. All right. Mm -hmm. So what I will say, there's going to, I still have to, I hate to do this because people hate this. There's a saying that admissions officers use all the time when you ask a question and the the answer is always, it depends, it depends, it depends. Right. (laughs) You know, and I don't want to sort of fall in that trap. I don't want to be evasive. So but I'm going to sort of be that way <laughs> and say it does kind of depend. But what I will say is this overwhelming majority of the time grade is more important than score. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, first of all, there's just so much research that shows grades predict grades mm-hmm. and every school has done their own study on that. And that's why you always hear that the transcript is king. And so there's so much research and they're coming in feeling like their best predictor of grades is grades. And so nothing kind of can sort of supplant or sort of trump that. Um, Grades show your ability, put the whole thing together. What do I mean the whole thing together? Motivation, you have to have it to do it. Discipline, you have to have it to do it. Emotional stability, you know, you can have motivation and discipline, but if you can't get out of bed, you know, um, you're not going to do it. And then do you see even relationships with teachers not i'm not trying to say you have a bad relationship with teacher that means you get low grades but if you have the ability to put the whole thing together that's going to predict grades better than any other thing that they have and they know that and they've got research from their own studies they've read national studies everybody knows that so nothing can kind of trump the transcript um in, in general now for those of you who are really new there are exams at the end of ap classes and they are graded between one to five And you'll traditionally hear people say three is a passing grade. I prefer to use another term called a qualifying grade, not a passing grade. And that's the score that a school would either um, give you college credit for or allow you to opt out of um, introductory courses. And that's going to vary school by school in terms of what's considered a good score for that school. So three is commonly a good school at, at a lot of schools, but the more selective schools, really fours and fives would be really good schools for them. So what are the times when it might be the opposite or it's, it's a lot more nuanced? So the important thing to keep in mind, and we've said this before, but I'll say it again, because not everybody hears every episode. 
it's very common for colleges to read as a school group. And so what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is let's just make up, I'll pick university right close to here, Emory University. Okay, let's say I'm Emory University and let's say I'm reading, I've got a bunch of applications from Chicago. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at some of, there's going to be certain schools, you know, like Walter Payton, like New Trier. I mean, these are just really schools that are always going to send a bunch of kids to a place like Emory. And so when they have that and they have a cluster like that, they will read them collectively. And when you read, when I, when I mean read collectively, they'll be comparing each of this, the grades, the courses selected, the AP scores. They'll be comparing all the students to each other. And it's actually extremely helpful to do that. If you've ever done that as an exercise, which I did in admissions, it's incredibly, I'm, I'm a huge believer in reading as a school group. Not everybody does it. Some schools, of course, just crunch numbers. We know that and make decisions just off numbers. Other schools read more by major than they read by school group, you know, and they'll read like the engineers together, you know, across a bunch of different schools. But let's say you're reading as a school group. One thing that's incredibly helpful about that is you can tell right away, uh, let's say you can tell where the grade inflation and the grade deflation is. So let's say there's like 13 kids applying from the same school. And let's say the first time I open up, I'm like, wow, this student has like a 94 degree, 94 in AP physics. I'm impressed. But then when you read as a school group, you can say, gee, you know, 12 of these 13 kids had grades of 92 or higher. This teacher really grades easily. Okay. Or you can also have the opposite too. Like, gee, you know what? We're, we really, you know, this student's got 85. It's not kind of the best grade. But then you read everybody else. So you're like, I read 13 kids and th- we know these kids are all strong. And there were, there's only like highest grade of everybody was a 92 and there's like only one other night. So you can tell where the grade inflation is. You can tell where the grade deflation is. You can tell if you're getting the same counselor, which oftentimes you are, you know, writing. And it depends once again, right? Like private schools versus public schools. Public schools tend to have a lot of different counselors. So it just depends. Um, you're not always getting the same counselor, but even still, even if it's a few different counselors writing, you can tell by what they say. Um, whether a student really stands out or if it's standard boilerplate stuff. I mean, I remember when I was doing this, there was one person that, and this is kind of a big feeder for us. They were so over the top effusive with everybody. They literally made every kid sound like the best kid to walk planet earth. (laughs) And I literally reached out to them and said, you know, you're, you're not helping your kids because I can't trust what you're saying because you're just over, over the top with your adulation. So you can tell, when you read as a school group, like what references really pop versus this person tends to embellish. Hmm. Now, the reason I bring that up is this is where scores can hurt. So grades still really trump. But if I'm reading and I'm noticing most of the people pretty much have fours and fives on this test and then the student has a two, that's not good. Okay, because I want to know why is it that everybody else was able to have content mastery? AP scores are very respected by schools. They're very familiar with them. They know what they they are. They know what they mean. They don't always expect them because, remember, if you take APs your senior year, colleges don't even get to see those scores. So they're used to, like, you know, putting more weight on the on the actual grade than, than the scores. Any senior AP, they don't even get to see the scores because people are taking the AP exams in May and June right now, at, long after decisions are made. But – when you read as a school group and something somebody stands out as a low score, that can be concerning, especially if there's so much grade inflation that grades don't help me. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually, it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes, it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that 5000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. 
So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. So this is an example, like, let's say um, I'm an AP uh, U.S. history teacher. Okay. A push, by the way, Dave, that's an inside joke. We just record it and he didn't know what a push was. I was giving him a hard time. <laughs> so he, the good thing about Dave is he, he can take it. He's not defensive. He's not thin skinned, <laughs> man. So that's my guy right there. Oh, Dave. So I, I'm an a push teacher. And what I notice is all the grades are high in the class. They're like all high. Well, now grades aren't helping me because they're not giving me the ability to differentiate. And if grades don't give me the ability to differentiate and then the scores do, that's the case I'm going to put more focus on the scores. Does that make sense, Anika? Because the grades didn't the grades didn't really help me. The teacher gave everybody high grades. So grades didn't it, gr- grades are helpful if they show differentiation. They're not going to show me differentiation. Now they're not helpful. And and that would be a case where scores would help. But going back to the the point of it, it depends. Like this anonymous child in Illinois, like I, I feel like he's cringing right now. So it sounds like when you say that to me, I take that as they both matter. They do. They both absolutely matter. Mm-hmm. They both absolutely matter, especially for someone submitting. So you know you don't have to submit your AP scores, but if you submit them and they're low, they are going to hurt you, mm-hmm. especially a selective school. You know, especially a selective school, you do not. A lot of times I have, I'm when I'm working with students, I'm like, don't submit that score. Okay. Just don't. So, yeah. So they absolutely both matter. Schools are very familiar with the AP. They know what a one, two, three, four, and a five are. And they, they, they are, because they are standardized, nationally normed, there's a kind of a comfort level with that. And there are going to be some people that really love that. And so the times when the scores will help the most was when grades don't differentiate. Hmm, okay. That that would be the time when when the when the scores would help. But to answer your question, they both matter when they're submitted. And the more selective the school, the more everything matters because hmm. because you're looking for ways to differentiate one student from another. And people may not realize this. It's it's really not that easy. It's not that easy in some cases when students have high grades. Students have rigor. Students find recommenders that are really good. There's a lot of people that are involved in a lot of activities. And so it's not necessarily clear that this person's extracurriculars pop way more than this other person. Any little thing that that differentiates is going to help you. And if one person is getting a two and another is getting a five, that's a big deal. So anonymous student in Illinois needs to partner with his counselor, I'm assuming, his high school counselor, to determine when and when and if he should submit his score, if it's not like a top score. Yeah, but I'm going to go a step back. It's really worth it to put time into your APs. Like not only can you earn college credit or get exempt out of college courses, mm-hmm. there hasn't been that much talked about, about this so far, Anika, but in this age of test optional that we're in right now, mm-hmm. where the majority of kids did not submit scores for the class of 2021, that's leads to more emphasis on other academic factors. And when you're losing one standardized test, having another one is can give can give people a degree of confidence that you you have mastery of the material. Now I'll tell you where it another time where it can get where it can get tricky in this situation. And that is a really bad school. So you a don't bad high school or bad yeah school? Okay. yeah bad high school. And I, okay. when I mean bad I'm not talking about necessarily crime and things like that. I'm talking about as a college, when I look at the study, of the college profile, I don't get a lot of confidence that that a, a large percentage of students are prepared to do rigorous work. Hmm. OK, now this can cut both ways because sometimes at a bad school, people can look at a lower score and they can say, you know, I don't necessarily want to fault the student as much because the teaching may not have been that good here. It still could be someone that could blossom and flourish in our better environment. But on the other hand, it can also ding you because, remember, admissions is about risk and reward. 
And you look riskier now with a low score because I don't trust your school that much. It's not that great of a school. And, and because your school is not that great of a school, I can tell by the school profile or some schools actually do experiential ratings and track, track how students from certain schools have done at their school. Maybe you haven't fared well. Those kinds of things tend to put a little bit more of an emphasis, can lead to put a little bit more of an emphasis on the standardized testing to suss out the people that really have content mastery. Because doing well on an AP is seen as you have content mastery. That's how it will be seen. Okay, you actually have mastery of that content. And so it is highly respected. So there, there's just some situations that are unique so that I can't just come out and say one size fits all. It's a, that's why it's such a good question because it's tough and nuanced. Any Questions, thoughts, anything mm-hmm. not clear? No. Good luck, Anonymous in Illinois. Good luck, Anonymous, it. and good luck, Anika, with your <laughs> writing endeavors <laughs> and all your mom's groups you're in and getting back to jogging regularly and all the million things that you're doing, one mm-hmm. of which won't be cooking. We know that. <laughs> nope. I finally settled, too, because I keep going back and forth. I'm not doing it. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think if the, now that you're you know, you started as an early forty something and now you're getting up into the later forty somethings. Mm-hmm. It's not it's changing over. now. It's, it's over. over. Yeah. It's, it's over. A <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> All right. Thank you again, Anika, for everything. You've you've been awesome. No, thank you, Mark. The show must and will go on. It most definitely will. And you know you and I will be in regular communication. Mm-hmm. See y'all later. Bye. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. Okay, friends, we are in part three of my interview with Mark Kantrowitz. And today, Mark talks about the decision to not cut the family contribution in half because multiple kids are in college. A lot of people have relied on that. You get more kids in college, your EFC goes down. Not true anymore, and he explains why. Mark talks about how the college expenses are particularly harder on lower-income families. Mark discusses professional judgment and special circumstance and the many ways that new FAFSA will expand opportunities for a special circumstance appeal. And finally, Mark discusses how FAFSA verification should be reduced with the new simplified FAFSA. Listen and enjoy. Yeah, I was just about to ask you about that, the family assessment. Talk about this, because this is one of the biggest changes in the in the bill and one that's pretty controversial, especially for middle-income families and multiple kids in college. So the number of children in college, or NIC, another acronym, um, it's only used internal to the formula, was used in two places uh, on the financial aid formula. One is in setting the income protection allowance, because you would have uh, the, the household size, the family size, and the number of children in college. More children meant a higher income protection allowance. But when these children were off in college, it would reduce the income protection allowance. Well, that reduction is no more, so that is beneficial to the families. The other way, though, uh, is the parent contribution portion of the expected family contribution was divided by the number of children in college. They had to be enrolled at least half time. But um, when you went from one child in college to two children in college, that was almost like dividing the parent income in half. And the idea was just because you have two children in college doesn't mean you have twice as much cash flow available to pay for their college costs. And the fam- the FAFSA formula was focused more on cash flow than on wealth. But Senator Alexander, according to his staff, felt that there should be no advantage to a family simply because their children are spaced closer together. After all, if you have twins versus two children are separated in age by four years, you still have two children either way. Why should the parent of the twins get more money for, to pay for college than the, the other parent? So he was adamant about making this change. Now, the increases in the income protection allowance kind of compensate for this change for low-income families that have multiple children in college. And it's partly because if you have a zero EFC, half of zero is still zero. So with families that have a lower student aid index, the division by the number of children in college, that going away, doesn't have as much of an impact 
especially since income protection allowance is much higher than before. But for middle and high income families, it did make a really big difference. And you would have some families who had six figure incomes, over $100,000 a year in income, but they had three or four children in college at the same time. And they might maybe even got the Pell Grant. It was less than 1% of parents with six figure income, but it enabled some families to get a lot more financial aid than they otherwise would have. Uh, and because of this change, those families are not going to be happy. Now, they can compensate for this by saving for college in advance so that they're not as dependent on how much cash they have available from their income each year. But it is going to be more of a struggle for middle and high income families. But then again, they're middle and high income families, so they have an easier time paying for college than a low income family. A low income student pays a greater share of total family income after the grants and scholarships to cover the costs at a community college than a middle income family pays to send their child to a four year private nonprofit college. And middle income families pay a greater share than high income families. So, and it's, you often hear this grass is always greener argument that middle income families are too poor to afford college, but too wealthy to get financial aid. Probably going to hear that more often. But the reality is that they usually have an easier job paying for college than the low income families. Yeah, and especially in Georgia, where, you know, there's all, virtually almost no need based, state based aid. It's all merit based through the Hope and Zell Miller. And, you know, a study was done over 50% of gross income can be expected to go toward the cost of college for for states where there's literally no commitment to high financial need kids from a state-based need-based grants. And the interesting thing is that some of these um, programs where if you're in the top 10% of your class, you get uh, a lot of financial aid, um, they actually do improve the financial aid for some low-income students. I mean, obviously, ones in the top 10%, uh, more so than certain other policies. But on the other hand, the promised scholarship programs where it's free tuition at public colleges in the state, uh, often community colleges, but in some states like New York, it's uh, four-year colleges as well. The it, It's got an interesting dynamic. The low-income students don't get all that much more money because they're already getting the Pell Grant and state grants that pretty much make tuition free. And these programs are last dollar financial aid programs, so they assume that all your other financial aid is being applied to tuition before they kick in any extra money. Most of the extra money is going to the uh, middle income families who weren't getting the Pell Grant or the state grants. So the financial benefit is mostly to the middle income families, not to the low income families. And the high income families, well, there usually are income caps that prevent them from getting these uh, promised scholarship programs. On the other hand, the low income students see a significant increase in college enrollment because the messaging that tuition is free is very powerful marketing. And so you, you might see a 10 to 20% increase in enrollment, mostly from the low income students who fear college costs. And um, whereas the middle and high income families, you don't see that much of an increase in college enrollment. So the, the low income students are not getting a financial benefit in terms of more aid and maybe a few hundred dollars at most, but they are getting a benefit in that college-capable students are, more of them are pursuing college education, and after they graduate, uh, their financial situation is going to be better because they will be able to get better-paying jobs. Well said. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, the recommended resource for episode 171 is a book that belongs in the conversation for the best new book to hit the market in college admissions in the last three to five years. And the title is The College Conversation. And the subtitle is A Practical Companion for Parents to Guide Their Children Along the Path to Higher Education. And the book is written by Eric Ferda and Jock Steinberg. You may remember Jock Steinberg wrote the breathtaking book, the Gatekeepers, 
and Eric Furta served as Dean of Admission at the University of Pennsylvania for well over a decade. And I hesitated to bring the, this book to you now because Eric's committed to come on our podcast and actually talk about it. But this will just be the quick version, and you can get more detail then. The book is divided into five sections, and they take you through the process of conversations. So you have the conversations about the discovery phase. And here they address simple things like, why college in the first place? And then they transition to conversations about the search. And throughout the book, you're having conversations with your parents, you're having conversations with yourself. And then there's the reflection piece brought on by Eric as a dean of admission, and that's invaluable. Then you have the conversations about the application, which is the third phase, conversations about the decision, fourth phase, and finally, conversations about the transition to college. And I find the dean's perspective incredibly insightful. I really, really love this book. I'm recommending it for everyone, and I actually can't wait to have Eric on the podcast to really dive deeper into it with him. I think you guys are going to really love that interview. Now I return to my interview with Mark Kantrowitz. Now, Mark, I know you've touched on um, professional judgment and special circumstances. My understanding is there's going to be more opportunity for special circumstances and professional judgment with this new bill. I actually heard, uh, I know this is an individual case, but I actually heard uh, a financial aid officer who was so concerned about the family division that we just talked about that said that their school might entertain that as a special circumstance. But can you explain the concept of professional judgment in special circumstance and explain it why some people feel there's going to be more opportunities or some changes in this new bill related to that? So special circumstances and is, is an appeal process. It's sometimes called a professional judgment review, a special circumstances review, or a financial aid appeal. And the FAFSA is a one-size-fits-all form that doesn't let you say, well, we have this unusual circumstance. And a special circumstance is anything that changed from that prior, prior year to the present. So, for example, students who are filing the FAFSA now, uh, starting uh, in October 1st of this year, it's going to be based on 2019 income, which is before the pandemic. And with a third of American workers having lost their jobs, the income in the prior, prior year is not necessarily going to be reflective of ability to pay during the 2022 award, I know the 2021-22 award year, which is this fall. And so these families want to be able to say, well, I lost my job. And so the, that income no longer applies. So that's one kind of difference. And most often a change in um, job loss, pay cuts, furloughs, anything that changes your income. Uh, the other kind of difference is anything that differentiates you from the typical family. And that might include um, you have a special needs child who needs 24-7 nursing care, or you're caring for an elderly parent who needs some more care, or maybe you have siblings who are in private school, so you're paying tuition for them, or maybe you have disability-related expenses, and anything that differentiates you from the typical family. So it's all about differences, Dim differences from two years ago to the present, or differences from the typical family. And college financial aid administrators have the authority to review these circumstances and their financial impact on the family and make adjustments to the FAFSA or the cost of attendance to accommodate them. So if your income has changed, they might substitute an estimate of your current income or maybe your income during uh, the upcoming academic year. They can provide an estimate of that and use that instead of your actual income from two years ago. And the new FAFSA is going to do a few things with regard to this. First of all, they're adding new categories of information that can be considered a special circumstance, like the number of children in college will now be um, a potential special circumstance. So if you're a parent who has triplets, that, uh, that may put a lot of financial pressure on your family. And you could appeal to the college, and you could always appeal if a parent was going back to school at the same time as the children, because the parents didn't count in the number at college. But now you'll you'll be able to appeal based on that. Also, the, some colleges had a policy where they wouldn't consider any financial aid appeals. They just refused to do it. So I have encountered a few community colleges that did this. And that was problematic, because let's say that you're a 
independent student, you're quitting your job to go back to school full time, you're going to a community college. Uh, the FAFSA is based on prior prior year income from two years ago, and the college doesn't do consider that appeal. Well, you're not getting the Pell Grant because you were earning income two years ago, even though now you don't have income. And by the time uh, you're there for your third year, well, you might not be there for your third year. Well, then it might finally catch up with I mean, your change in income. But in the meantime, you go two years without a Pell Grant. So the, the new FAFSA rules are going to require colleges to consider financial aid appeals and to not allow them to dismiss them out of hand. So they can't have a policy or practice that responds in a negative to all financial aid appeals. Now, it's, it's not a huge workload for the colleges. In a normal year, you'll have maybe 2 to 3% of uh, appeals resulting in a change. This year, it's probably triple that because of the pandemic. But in a normal year, it, it is not going to be that much additional workload for the colleges. And realistically, these are students who have difficult financial situations that the college needs to make an accommodation for. Doesn't mean they're going to get more money from the college, but maybe they'll get more money from the federal and state governments. That was very thorough. Thank you. Now, I know another change that a lot of people are excited about is, and you've alluded to this earlier, FAFSA verification. A number of people are, believe that there's going to be less verification. Um, is that because things are being more synced to tax returns, or is there another reason why, you know, proponents of um, cleaning up the system believe that the FAFSA simplification is going to result in less kids, particularly um, under-resourced kids, you know, being FAFSA verified? Well, in a way, verification discriminates against low-income students because you're going to rob a bank, where do you go? You go to banks because that's where the money is. So their idea is, well, focus on the Pell Grant recipients because that's where the money is. And so if you're a Pell Grant recipient, you're much more likely to be verified than a student who doesn't get a Pell Grant. And the problem is that many of the students who are verified, it doesn't lead to any change in their EFC. It just confirms that, yes, they were eligible for this. Now, there's a small amount of fraud and a small amount of errors that do get caught by this, but is it really worth putting so many students through the ringer in order to catch a really small percentage of undeserved financial aid? And the conclusion is probably not that we need to have a more intelligent method of determining um, who's going to be selected for verification. So maybe there's an unusual aspect of the information on the FAFSA that can trigger verification. So it used to be that about a third of all FAFSAs were selected for verification. But because the IRS data retrieval tool allows transferring of information from federal income tax returns to the FAFSA, and those data elements are not subject to verification, the verification rate has dropped to 18%. It could drop further, but only about half of applicants are using IRS data retrieval tool these days. Oh, wow. It's only half? It's only half. Now, partly that's because in a lot of situations in which you're not eligible. So if there's a change in marital status, that usually meant that you weren't eligible. Also, if you have foreign income, that was another circumstance in which you, you would be uh, ineligible to use it. They're going to try to improve things so that more will be eligible to use it and that more data will be transferred from the IRS. So the number of students who need to be verified will go down, hopefully into the single digits. In addition, there is now going to be a mandate that the U.S. Department of Education study the effectiveness of verification and justify to Congress the methods that it's using to select students for verification to make sure that it is indeed verifying only those who are likely to lead to a change in the FAFSA data. And if a student was verified last year when they were freshmen and it didn't lead to a change and the same trigger is occurring this year, well, probably shouldn't select them again. And they're, they're starting to use what's called a machine learning model to select students for verification. It supposedly is leading to improvements 
uh, in uh, the precision with which it selects applicants for verification. Remains to be seen just how much better that does. But uh, the goal is there's going to be a, a strict goal that says, ultimately, we want to have everyone who is selected for verification to be one for whom there was an error that needed to be corrected that would make a difference on the FAFSA. And that maybe they can do this more and more precisely so that only people for whom there might be a change get selected and nobody for whom there won't be a change get selected. So to the extent that they can do that with greater accuracy, it will reduce the number of students selected for verification, and maybe it'll stop some students from dropping out of college because I mean, they can't complete verification. Because in many cases, these students have to ask their parents for the information to complete the FAFSA because the parents don't want to have anything to do with the FAFSA. And they get that information from the parents. And then the mm -hmm. students selected for verification, they have to go back to the parents who are resistant to helping with verification to ask them for additional information. And so it gives the parents another opportunity to say no to the child. And so if you reduce verification, you'll have more students getting the financial aid they deserve and therefore being able to enroll in college and ultimately graduate from college. Next week in the news, test optional admissions yields benefits. Major study finds that college Gain, colleges gain Pell Grant recipients, minority students, and women. An article by Scott Jasek from Inside Higher Ed. Our question from a listener is, Mark, what do you think about the quality and caliber of Pacific Northwest liberal arts colleges such as Willamette, Lewis and Clark, Occidental, and University of Puget Sound? Our interview is the final part with Mark Kantrowitz on the new simplified FAFSA. And our college spotlight comes to you. It's the alma mater of the new NFL number one draft pick, Trevor Lawrence, Clemson University. And Dave is doing double devotion duty. So this is a first, friends. Episode 171. Dave's literally on the job doing his emergency doctor gig. They gave him a couple <laughs> minutes to break away to do our previews. And so this is recording the podcast while you're in the middle of an emergency medical doctor shift. <laughs> I said, if it's just shot in the leg, don't bug me. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. <laughs> it needs to be a shot in the heart to get my attention. <laughs> That's right. All peripheral gunshot wounds can wait. <laughs> well, I, I learned something this week, Day. Remember last week we were talking about Asian Americans, do they face a stiffer standard? Yeah. And you're like, oh, I know all about the Hmong. Uh, you know, Asian Americans because of the Clint Eastwood movie. <laughs> I found out you're not as much of an expert as I thought. We got a great email that came in this week from a podcast listener said, loved your episode. But by the way, the H is silent. And she had studied the people <laughs> excessively. So we, I guess it's Hmong, not Hmong. So we showed our lack of fluency and expertise of Asian Americans on that last episode. So. Thanks to listeners for pointing out and helping us be better next time. Absolutely. But it was still a great movie, Gran Torino. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. Get back to work, man. No problem, friend. See you next week. <laughs> and that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please subscribe so you get every episode as soon as it is released. If you are interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on your favorite podcast listening app. I am the producer of the Your College Bound Kid podcast. Well, you have a fantastic team of nine people. Shout out to our three co-hosts, Anika Madden. Dr. David Williams, and Dr. Lisa Ruff. Our sound engineer, who fixes all of our many errors, is Nemanja Montfitch. The amazing music you hear is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Our image editor is Talha Khan. And our webmaster is Dalianos Dimitri. If you want to have a college coaching session with me, just text me at 404 664 4340. If you have a question you want to ask, 
or a college you want Lisa or me to do a spotlight on, or if you have a recommended resource or an article you think we should share, just send it to questions at yourclouds.com. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you, our family, next week.